to this meeting of the scientific uh, guidance panel for the uh, California Environmental Bio, uh, Contaminant Biomonitoring Program, otherwise known as Biomonitoring California. Thank you all for participating and sharing your expertise. Before um, we get into the, the summary of the November meeting, I'd like um, for you to join me in welcoming Laura Cushing as the newest member of the SGP. Great. Welcome, Laura. Laura, Laura is an assistant professor of environmental health sciences and the fielding presidential chair in health equity at the University of California, Los Angeles. Her research focuses on patterns and health consequences of social inequities and exposures to environmental hazards in the United States. She is interested in analytical methods to characterize the joint effects of environmental and social stressors on health that can inform efforts to reduce environmental health disparities. Laura earned her MPH in epidemiology and PhD in energy and resources from the University of California, Berkeley. Laura, now I'm going to administer the oath of office. All right, I think if you would like to, you can raise your right hand. All right, I, Laura Cushing, Oh, repeat uh, for me. <laughs> hi, Lara Cushing. I had to unmute myself there. Okay. Hi, um, I, Lara Cushing. Do solemnly swear. Do solemnly swear. That I will support and defend. That I will support and defend. The Constitution of the United States and the Constitution of the State of California. The Constitution of the United States and the Constitution of the State of California. Against all enemies, foreign and domestic against all enemies, foreign and domestic. That I will bear true faith and allegiance. That I will bear, bear true faith and allegiance. To the Constitution of the United States and the Constitution of the State of California. To the Constitution of the United States and the Constitution of the State of California. That I take this obligation freely. That I take this obligation freely. Without any mental reservation or purpose of evasion without any mental reservation or purpose of evasion. And that I will well and faithfully discharge. And that I will well and faithfully discharge. The duties upon which I'm about to enter. The duties upon which I'm about to enter. Great, thank you and congratulations. And welcome thank to you. the SCP panel. All right. So um, now I'll jump to a recap from the November 8th meeting. So the meeting began with an update on the program activities with the remainder of the meeting focused on perfluoroalkyl and polyfluoroalkyl substances or PFOSs, which included presentations from national and international experts. The afternoon discussion with the panel um, speakers in the audience um, went uh, deeper into PFAS biomonitoring to support exposure reduction efforts, next steps, and discussion points on these, on these topics included um, identifying and evaluating determinants of PFAS exposures, demographics, demography, and other factors, the importance of determining the specific PFAS is used in consumer products and other applications, um, looking at shifting market trends in PFOSs driven by changes such as reformulation in consumer products or removal of PFOSs from food um, contact materials, and then examining how that plays out in biomonitoring data. Um, and then lastly, evaluating the impacts of regulatory and other efforts to reduce exposures by tracking trends of PFOS levels in biological samples over relevant time periods. The, uh, the summary um, from this November meeting and the complete transcript have been posted on the November SGP meeting webpage on biomonitoring.ca.gov. So since we are meeting virtually today, um, I would like to have the other SGP members introduce themselves. Um, and so I will 
basically call everyone by name and then if they can just unmute themselves and introduce themselves to to everyone else. So I'll start with Carl. Carl Craner, the Distinguished Professor of Philosophy and Faculty Member in Environmental Toxicology at the University of California, Riverside. Great, hi. Um, Oliver. Oliver Fien, um, not so distinguished, but a uh, full professor um, at UC Davis in the um, U um, Genome Center. I'm doing mass spectrometry in environmental toxicology. Great. Uh, Unha? Yes, I'm Una Ha. I'm a professor uh, of environmental health in the School of Public Health in San Diego State University. Great. Tom? Uh, Tom, I'm Tom McCown. I'm a professor emeritus of environmental health sciences at the University of California, Berkeley. I'm also a retired affiliate at the Lawrence Berkeley National Laboratory. Thank you. And Jenny? Hi, um, I'm name is Penelope Quintana, or also known as Jenny. I'm a professor of public health at the School of Public Health at San Diego State University in environmental health. Thank you. All right, thank you. And Jose? Hi, Jose Suarez at the Herbert Ward High School of Public Health at the University of California, San Diego. And welcome Dr. Cushing to, to the Scientific Guidance Panel. Thank you. And then uh, lastly, Ulrika. Hi, I'm Ulrika Luderer. I'm a professor of environmental and occupational health at the University of California, Irvine. Great. Well, thank you, everyone, and um, thanks for joining us on this Friday afternoon. So now I, I'll be handing it off to Ulrika, who will provide more details about today's meeting. Um, Ulrika is stepping in for Meg Schwartzman, our, our, the chair of the SGP, um, who could not be with us here this afternoon. Ulrika. Hey, thank you. Um, well, I'd also like to welcome Dr. Cushing to the panel. And um, then, I'm sorry. Sorry about that. Um, uh, so the panel goals for the meeting today are to first hear presentations um, with updates on program activities, including AB 617 community biomonitoring studies and information to prompt a discussion of program planning. And the primary goal of the meeting is to obtain the panels and the public's input on near-term and longer-term program priorities. We'll also hear a report back on the Buck et al. 2011 definition of perfluoroalkyl and polyfluoroalkyl substances, or PFASs, to follow up on our discussion at the November 2021 SGP meeting and to provide input on the next steps. There will be time for panel questions or uh, questions from the panel and the audience after each presentation. During the question periods after each talk, speakers will remain unmuted with their webcams showing so they can respond to questions from the panel and audience. And if STP members wish to speak or ask a question, please raise your hand and I will call on you at the appropriate time and then you can unmute yourself to ask your question to provide or to provide your comment. If webinar attendees have questions or comments during the question periods after each talk, you can submit, <coughs> submit them via the Q&A feature of Zoom webinar or by email to biomonitoring at oeha.ca.gov. We'll not be using the chat function during the meeting. Please keep your comments brief and focused on the items under discussion. Relevant comments will be read aloud and paraphrased when necessary. If webinar attendees wish to speak during the public comments period and discussion sessions, please use the raise hand feature in Zoom webinar and I'll call on you at the appropriate time. Now I'd like to introduce Narissa Wu. Narissa Wu is chief of the exposure assessment section in the environmental health investigations branch at the California Department of Public Health or CDPH and the overall lead for biomonitoring California. She will give an update on current program activities and provide information related to future planning. Marissa. Good afternoon, everybody. Can you hear me? Everyone's okay. okay. All right, let me get my slides up. All righty. Well, good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to Dr. Cushing. Really looking forward to having your expertise on our panel. 
Um, I am going to be giving some administrative updates today, and then I'll talk briefly about the CARE study, giving you a status update. But I'm going to spend most of my time focusing on future program directions, what's coming for the program. So this has been a transitional time for us in that we are growing. We're almost doubling our staff thanks to the budget increase that we were provided starting in July 2021. So a lot of our effort over the past months has gone into planning what that's going to look like and doing a lot of the administrative tasks necessary to manage this new budget and bring in new staff. And speaking of staff, we do have one staff update to report, Shoba, who has been such a big part of this program. She's presented in multiple times in this forum, will be leaving the program in April. Um, congratulations to Shoba for your new position and thank you for all of your hard work, but we will really miss you a lot at Biomonitoring California. So on the care front, this is a California regional exposure study. Um, we have been immersed in finalizing our report, which will provide detailed results and demographic trends and comparisons between CARE LA and region two. And we hope to have this report released in the coming months. And as part of the work with CARE, um, we've been thinking a lot about the methodology and the feasibility of getting back into the field where we left off. Um, but given the difficulties of conducting care and the limits to the design as implemented for regions one through three, we have come to the conclusion definitively that we will not be continuing care. So part of the transition at this time period is to think a lot about what worked with care and what can and can't be learned from the care design and then how to best design studies going forward to the future to meet our program goals. So part of that has been thinking a lot about what are our program priorities. And this slide um, summarizes the discussion we had last July with this panel about program priorities. Um, these are the top, thing, top items that came out of that discussion. Mitigation of environmental health inequities, conducting intervention studies to identify impacts of public policy and mitigation strategies, evaluation of exposures associated with climate change, utilization of non-targeted screening to identify new exposures of concern, and conducting meaningful surveillance within program resources. We've had input from other stakeholders as well, partly through our environmental justice listening sessions, but also through stakeholders who have attended these meetings and have um, communicated it with us through other forums. And there are some similar themes between these and the last slide, environmental justice and equity work, um, conducting surveillance to identify inequities, building community capacity, designing studies that lead to policies that re reduce exposures, as well as conducting community-focused and community-based participatory studies, monitoring of temporal trends, and including more studies, um, more chemicals and studies, and thinking about the synergisms between chemicals. We also have our own program values, and some of those are reflected in our founding legislation. Um, so I've taken the inputs from all of these different sources and, and kind of categorize them into buckets as their themes um, are related. Um, there's surveillance or evaluation of the presence of chemicals in a representative sample of Californians, which of course is one of our primary mandates. Looking at temporal trends as they relate both to the evaluation of policy and changes in our environment, which might be climate change. Um, there are other um, changes to our environment which might be evaluated. Um, identify highly exposed communities, um, evaluate strategies for exposure reduction, and expand the reach and sustainability of the program. So we will come back to this list, but keep these goals in mind as we go through um, these two presentations. So one of the things we've been thinking about a lot, and we have talked about it some here, is how we as a program can use our resources and our unique reach as a state program uh, most efficiently. And in the past, our studies have mostly involved, we've been involved at every stage from study design to field work, actually going out and collecting samples, conducting the field, um, the laboratory analysis, running results return, doing statistical analysis, and then eventual release of findings through publications and presentations. And each one of these steps takes considerable effort. They're very resource intensive, which has meant among other things that we don't always get our data out as efficiently as we would like. 
So one focus of the program going forward is finding ways that we can partner with others to use that expertise and our status as a state program to maximize our effectiveness and our sustainability. So for example, we've talked about utilizing previously collected samples as a way to be more efficient than conducting field work. Um, we can collaborate with those others who might be in the field collecting samples already and add biomonitoring to those studies. Um, our labs are already doing a great job of providing laboratory services on other studies. And as additional chemicals of concern are designated or as we expand chemical panels on a study, we should be working with state programs, other state programs um, to see how we can share methodology and also state capacity. We do provide a lot of technical support to other state programmers, state programs and other researchers. Um, and there has been a lot of discussion with CDC and the National Biomonitoring Network about designing tools that all state programs can access. So things like participant management tools and questionnaires. Um, and I really hope this is an initiative that comes to fruition because all state programs are really struggling with similar issues, how to run these very complex programs with limited resources. And then there's also working with collaborators on data analysis to help us get our data out. Um, and this is something that we talked a little bit about at our last meeting. So as follow up to that, um, we've put some thought with the help of um, Dr. Suarez into what information potential collaborators might wanna have when considering taking on a project to look at biomonitoring California data. So as a starting point, we have assembled all the information from our studies, including when samples were collected, how many participants were in the studies and the panel of analytes that were measured. And this is information that's already on our website, but we're organizing it in a way so that it's easier for somebody potentially looking for a project to see it all together. Then we're working on a data package for each study that will include the kind of information that you might wanna know um, when embarking on a study, things like study design and how participants were recruited or selected, the total N per panel, which is not always the same as the end of the participants in the study. Um, and then a summary of work that's already been done today. Have we posted summary statistics? Have we looked at differences by demographics? Have we looked at the exposure questions? And then we have information on the questionnaires themselves, the overall topic areas, things like housing or dietary habits or occupation, the questions that we ask and the distributions of responses. So this is an example from CARE2, which had 359 participants overall. And these are a few of the questions that we asked related to housing. How long have you lived in your home? When was your house or apartment built? Is there wall-to-wall -wall carpeting in any room of your house? Are any of your carpets or rugs stain resistant or water resistant? Um, so we'll provide the number of participants who provided information. So not including the don't knows or prefer not to answer responses. And you can see the distribution of responses. So for example, if you're thinking of looking at PFAS levels and whether somebody had carpets or rugs in their homes, you'd be able to look at this and, and this will help potential collaborators determine if there is a study question that they might wanna investigate using our data set. So the preparation of these materials, first of all, take a little time for us to get all of this together, but it doesn't mean that we are stepping back from doing our own analyses. We have a really great team of epidemiologists and they will continue to do their own work and also work in partnership with external collaborators. But with everything we're trying to do and the amount of data that we've accumulated, we're just not gonna get to this data ourselves. And it doesn't make sense for us to hold it back and, and not share it with others. So when we get to the discussion portion of this talk, there are two things I'd like your input on. If you were considering using this data for a project or you have a student or collaborator who might want to do so, what other information would you want to have included in this data package? And second, I think it's really important to make this data resource broadly available um, to people beyond our normal collaborators and people who already know about the program. So do you have suggestions about how to go, make, how, how to go about making this data more widely available and more visible to other researchers? For our surveillance work, as mentioned, um, we have considered the limitations of study design, even given our larger budget, and we have decided not to return to the model of the California Regional Exposure Study, in large part because it was so difficult getting a representative sample and because the pace at which we would have to cover regions in order to allow for temporal trend analysis or geographic comparisons was really just not feasible. 
So instead, we're planning to work with samples from the Genetic Disease Screening Program, or GDSP, to look at PFAS and other exposures in the population of pregnant women. And this will allow us to obtain samples at lower cost, but there's also a flexibility with these samples. For example, if there is another COVID surge, these are samples that we will still be able to access, um, which um, might not be the case with field work. So the use of GDSP samples will allow us to really focus on the issue of time trends for PFAS and other exposures. Um, our labs will be able to analyze about 500 samples per year for PFAS, and we do expect that a subset of the samples will also be available for additional analyses. So example, um, for example, um, we have talked in our previous meetings about organic fluorine, we've talked about semi-targeted screening, and we might be able to use these samples to screen for classes of compounds or to think about chemicals of emerging concern. So just a reminder of what GDSP does, so you know what the sample pool represents. Um, prenatal screening is offered to all pregnant women in California at their first prenatal visit. And screening is a combination of blood draws, both in the first and second trimester, and an ultrasound measurement. Um, currently about 60 to 70% of pregnant women of California participate in the state program. Newborn screening is also provided at the state. Almost all newborn babies are tested for metabolic disorders and other conditions using a dried blood spot, which is collected on filter paper via a heel stick that's um, implemented during the first couple days of life. Once prenatal screening is completed, the samples are generally discarded, but samples from Fresno, Kern, Kings, Madera, Tulare, Orange, and San Diego counties, the biobank counties, they are saved in the GDSP biobank. So counties from these, samples from these counties are split. One part, one aliquot is reserved as an archive and the other is made available to researchers. So it's about a 0.5 mil aliquot. Um, biobank samples have been archived over time, so we have the ability to go back in time as well as forward and look at a broad swath of a time trend. Um, we have also been able to obtain non-biobank samples from GDSP in the past, so that gives us the ability to look beyond our seven counties, look across the state, and because they're not archived, we have a larger sample or about one milliliter available to us. But because they're not archived, they're also not available from the past, and so that time trend work can only look into the future. Um, there are some samples that are not available. I think Kaiser patients are not part of the biobank and samples linked to genetic disease cases are also not available unless your research is specifically um, linked to that, that genetic disease. So thinking back to the goals of the program that we talked about earlier, the GDSP samples can help us address a number of these goals. It is a population-based sample for a very specific population and while there are subpopulations that are less represented in the state program, the GDSP program has very, very broad coverage. So it provides an opportunity to us to do sampling for surveillance. Depending on how we decide to sample from Biobank, we can really look at time trends in PFAS and other exposures. And we can address equity issues through comparison of biomarker levels by race, by Medi-Cal status, by zip code, or by distance from exposure sources. And of course, these samples do offer us a unique opportunity to use semi-targeted screening. The drawback of biobank samples are that it's only a serum sample, and so we can't do urinary analytes or whole blood analytes. And for metals, there's the additional problem that the serum separator gel in the tubes has a trace level of metals that we can't correct for. Um, so we are limited in the number of analytes we can run. Um, we also don't have contact with the participants, and so we don't have an opportunity to collect additional behavioral information or exposure information. We can't conduct results return or interact with participants in the way the program has traditionally done. So I think one of the challenges, considering our primary goals, is to think about ways that we can address our goals by maybe changing the way we've always done things. So for example, we can't do individual results return with these samples, but maybe there are ways that we can partner with healthcare providers and take what we learn from these studies to conduct outreach and education to um, prenatal clients or people thinking about starting a family. And while we can't conduct com community-based participatory research with GDSP samples, there may be ways that we can sample in a particular way and use semi-targeted screening to assess overall exposures and compare communities. 
Um, the other opportunity that this may give us is that given that biobank samples are relatively easy to obtain, um, we hope that it will enable us to conduct additional smaller studies that can be designed around meeting some of the goals that are not addressed by GDSP samples. So in the history of the program, we have usually had multiple samples, multiple studies overlapping at different phases. And you can see from this table that I've um, sort of organized our studies by the different goals that they address, um, that we've done a pretty good job of matching our studies to our program goals. Um, this is true for, this, for the studies that we have in planning right now, including Biobank, which is labeled here as Expanded Mamas, and Biomsphere um, and the AB617 projects that you'll hear about next. But we wanna make sure that going forward, and particularly for these additional studies that we wanna take on, that we, that we select them in a way that will address our wide range of goals. And we would like your input on how best to do this, whether it's to issue a request for information or solicit input in some other way for types of new projects. Um, and then there's a question of how we would evaluate new projects. How do we go about selecting new projects? So for the discussion, we have three areas of input that we'd like to get from you. Um, one is related to expanding collaborations for data analyses. Again, what other information would you want to have included in the data package? And how can we broaden our collaborations and make this information more widely available? For the GDSP projects, we'd like to hear from you about how we should focus that sampling. Should we focus on the biobank counties um, where the samples are only available from these seven counties, but we have the ability to look into the past as well as the future, and it is a smaller sample. Or should we be focusing on the non-biobank counties which allow us a broader look across California, a larger sample size, but the time trends only go forward. Um, because we have limits to how many samples we can analyze for PFAS each year, um, we wanna be thoughtful about how we design that sample. And I'm talking about this from a surveillance focus, but I do wanna mention that last time we met, we did talk about PFAS in Orange County and um, it came up that Orange County had introduced new water treatment in 2020 to reduce PFAS in drinking water. So as we're planning surveillance, there may be an opportunity for us to nest um, um, an intervention study at a community level, for example, comparing the rate of decline of PFAS in Orange County to another county where they don't have a similar water treatment system. Um, another thing to think about with our surveillance data collected is how that data might complement or be complemented by other efforts to capture PFAS information in the state. Um, the UC Irvine study of PFAS and health led by Scott Bartell and others has started recruiting participants. So there will be another pool of PFAS exposure information coming from Orange County. And there might be ways that our surveillance work can, can um, interact with that. Uh, we also wanna make sure our biobank projects address program goals. So one of the questions from this panel was to ask your input on ways that we might be able to sample or analyze data or communicate results in ways that address our goals. And again, the examples I gave earlier are um, things like working with healthcare providers to communicate results out, since we won't have the ability to do individual results return or working at a community comparison level um, by selecting samples in a way so that we can look at total exposures for communities. Finally, and um, these are questions that will be a topic for discussion for both this presentation as well as the upcoming presentation from Susan, as well as our overall discussion. Um, if we do have capacity to take on additional projects, um, how are ways that we can identify potential collaborators across the state? Um, how can we solicit input into what those projects might be? and which program goals are most important for us to consider? Um, how do we turn this into a rubric for evaluating potential projects? And with that, I'll end and open it up for questions. Okay. Thank you um, very much, Narissa. So now we have um, time allotted for panel and audience questions. And um, please, I um, uh, wanted to check with Cheryl, if there have been any questions received via Zoom, webinar Q&A, or via email? Yes, there's a question in the q and I don't know if you can see it. It says, following up from last spring's meeting, do you believe these samples will be used to monitor quaternary ammonium compounds, QACs? 
Um, we do not have currently, oh, which samples are, I'm sorry, could you clarify if you're talking about biobank samples or care samples? Is this re with regard to biobank? Um, this question came in during your talk. So I believe yeah, if the person who asked this question in Q&A could maybe bio oh, biobank. It's only a serum sample. And thus far, we have only run trials of um, quacks for um, urine. Oh, I'm sorry. I'm getting a chat that somebody else is going to answer the question. Anyway, no. um, so the biobank samples are only serum, and we have only done trials in urine and fecal samples. So I don't think we are ready to run these with quacks. Um, however, maybe June Sue's on the line. I don't know if that's something that's possible through semi-targeted screening. Looks like maybe not. Yeah, or I would suggest you take okay. panel. Yeah, panel I will do that. Yeah. All and just right. to clarify for everyone, the discussion questions Nerissa posed will be covered in the upcoming one hour discussion session. Right. So you can keep it to clarifying questions at this stage. Great, thank you. Um, I see that Tom has his hand raised, Tom. Yeah, uh, this is kind of a, a quick clarifying question and I think I have other issues, but I'll hold those to our broader discussion. But I was just um, in the CARES project when you were looking at the survey and I think more broadly, um, one of the things I don't know if we've focused on about people's uh, uh, time activity budgets is how much time they spend in transportation, particularly in automobiles and cars. And there's some emerging information about uh, the chemicals that are used in automobiles, uh, particularly flame retardants. A number of flame retardants apparently are showing up and have been in automobiles and without much fanfare or notice. And um, I mean, the other thing is that there are some very high uh, roadway exposures to people actually in automobiles. I mean, we measure a lot of near roadway exposures to communities that are near highways, but the people on the roadways. So again, it may not be a big contributor, but it might be useful at some point uh, either to go back and see if we have anything that relates to the amount of time people spend in transportation, particularly automobiles, or in the future, maybe think about whether we want to collect more time activity data related to transportation. Mm -hmm. We did have, so CARE had two surveys. One was sort of long-term behavioral habits, and one was collected right before, one was filled out right before the sample was collected. And that second survey did have some information on it about time and vehicle. I'm going to see if Adam could respond to this question, though, because he's most familiar with how it was asked. Adam, can you can you chime in on this? Um, I'm going to have to pull up the survey in a minute to answer that question. All right. Okay, thank you. Um, Jose, you have a question as well or a comment? Uh, yeah, a, a comment, um, and I'll keep it brief and we can discuss more about it, but um, I want to congratulate you for the great job at updating the website to make it more easy, easier to find all these different things. I really like the structure of this. I really enjoyed the tab, seeing there the projects tab, within which you can see all the different uh, structures within that. We can talk a little bit about um, like little tweaks here and there uh, to make it even more visible. But overall, congratulations. I think it's very, it makes it very easy once you get into what project you can see which chemicals and uh, are being measured, et cetera. Um, one thing since you were asking, one of the pieces that could also be a benefit here is adding one specific icon on top that may be for researchers. A lot of times researchers uh, want it, you know, they have a limited amount of time, they wanna make it very easy to see that. And if there's a tab just like we have there which is projects, chemical results, that there's one that says for researchers in which they could click on that and they get uh, they're able to download data if you if you want to have some of that uh, data available and that will be the next comment whether you want to have what type of data you would like to have it downloadable versus which ones you would want researchers to request access to um, 
of course, it's always a barrier. Every time somebody has to request some something becomes a barrier. But at the same time, then you know a little bit more who's getting what. But uh, it's something that, of course, you would need to discuss uh, a little more internally. But I think that would also help with this interaction with other people. Great. Thanks. And the website is run by OEHA. So all congratulations and suggestions go over to the OEHA staff. Um, and there is um, a lot of website work being done right now. And one of those conversations is how to make the data available once we, once we complete working on these data packages, how we can post them online. Thank you. Carl, I see you have your hand raised as well. Just a quick question. I know the, I see that the budget is up. Is that permanent money? If to the extent money can be permanent, it does look like it's a better time for the biomonitoring program. And the governor is trumpeting that California has a lot of money now. So I'm just wondering how you see things. Um, well, the budget is, it is general fund. So not tied to a special fund. And it is in our budget as you know a permanent budget item. So, um, nothing is ever really permanent in the budget. But as far as we can tell, it is long-term funding, which is wonderful. It allows us to um, do much more planning, um, assuming that we'll have this resource available to us. Thank you. That is uh, great news. Uh, and I don't see any other hands raised at the moment. So I think- uh, Ulrika, this yeah. is Sarah. There are yeah. hands raised. Lara and Carl both have their oh. hands up. Oh, well, Carl, do you have a, well, oh, sorry. I didn't not see Lara, Lara. <laughs> oh, does Carl, is your hand up from before? And I think Jose also, if, if you have another- You guys another... can lower your hands. Uh, oh no, Jose has another question. Sorry, back to Okay, <laughs> all right. Um, well, let's start with Lara. <laughs> All right, can I, can I respond oh. to Tom's question first? Because Adam has oh. just sent me this. Um, oh, okay. So we do ask in the past three days, approximately how much time have you spent in a vehicle on a freeway? So it's it's very specific towards the one nitropyrene um, analyses that we're doing for CARE 2. And it's a reflection of a very short time period. It's not like their overall habits. So depending on which analytes you are interested in, um, it, would, it would or would not um, be helpful. Hey, thank you. Um, now, Laura, you have a comment? Yeah, thank you. I had a quick question about the biobank samples. Um, seems like a great resource and an exciting direction to go. Um, and it looked like from your presentation that the type of information available is um, race, medical status, maybe residential address or something like that. Um, are, is there, so two questions, is there, is there anything else in those records about the um, person who gave the sample? And is there any ability to link um, to other administrative health data sets by social security number or something like that? So within the prenatal screening, there is some limited demographic available, um, demographic um, information available about the mom. There's her race, um, whether or not she has Medi-Cal for insurance, um, her gestational age, her last weight um, before the sample was taken. I'm trying to think of what else there is. And then we could get her residential address. But um, researchers do sometimes link prenatal to newborn records and then to outcomes databases like Vital Statistics. And in that way, we could get much more information on the sample. It is a more onerous process to get that information, but would open up this whole world of being able to do like um, birth outcomes and subsequent health assessments. Thank you. Um, Jose, you had another comment or question? Yeah, I, I, I have a few, but I'll, I'll just keep it short. And since we're talking about the biobank, um, the GDSP, of course, is also within um, the California Department of Public Health, as are you. Mm -hmm. And so then you could, I mean, I think it would be fantastic if people, participants um, in general, who I guess would be people who are getting screened, would have the opportunity to opt in to be part of different types of research. I know it's not in the part of, it's not in the mandate for the GDSP. However, this would allow you, 
us to obtain a lot of other information, especially the ones that you would have been able to collect with care, but now that that's starting to be phased out, you might be able to tap into that. Of course, this kind of involves having conversations at a higher level, mm-hmm. um, but this might be something that could be of interest to, G, uh, to GDSP in a partnership um, with California Biomonitoring to start including the option of people being contacted to ask an additional set of questions that mm-hmm. otherwise you would have asked for the care, but now you're going to save yourself a lot of, uh, you know, effort and funding by not having to do that with something that still could be very, very representative to some way, right? Of course, we know that people that opt into research tend to be a little bit different than those who, who don't even read the question or who don't want to be a part of that. So it sounds like Sarah has a, a response. I'm just going to suggest that we move on, save this for the discussion and finish up the question session. Okay, um, so then we will do that. <laughs> um, so the uh, next, uh, next we're going to have a presentation. Oh, by sorry, Sa- sorry, oh. Ulrika, this is yeah. Sarah. I meant you can call for any last questions. I didn't mean okay. to cut off that conversation. We actually are five minutes early, but I just okay. want to clarify that we want to hold Jose's topic for later okay. uh, to get into those sorts right. of details rather than going too far. But Narissa, right. if you had a response or anything like that, if you wanted to sure and go for it. Sure. Um, so participants actually don't opt into having their, their sample saved in biobank. They have to opt out of it. And so I think changing that, that administrative approach would be, a, it's a huge lift from GDSP's perspective. I do think there are ways that we can partner with the Center for Family Health, which is where GDSP sits. And one of the things that um, we've been talking about internally is maybe briefing that center and and demonstrating the strong link between the work we do and their interest and their clients. And so I think that is a really um, a great direction to go in. Opting out is way better than opting in for these types of things. So yes, great. Yeah. All right, any other questions before we go on to the next topic? I don't see any in the Q&A or the chat. All right, then I think we can go on to our next talk, which is going to be a talk by Susan Hurley. Susan is a research scientist in the Safer Alternatives Assessment and Biomonitoring section of OEHA. And Susan's going to provide us with an update on current community biomonitoring studies and information to help frame a discussion of upcoming priorities. Susan? All right, thank you, Maria. Share my screen. Welcome to Zoom. Please press one to join the meeting. Okay. Um, so let me just start uh, with uh, letting you know what I'll be talking about today. Uh, I'll start with some brief updates, or maybe not so brief updates, on um, the two projects uh, that we are currently conducting to support the goals of AB 617. And then uh, the second part of my presentation will focus on uh, planning for future community biomonitoring studies and uh, laying out the foundation for the discussion we'd like to have afterwards. So the, um, the first study that I'd like to talk about is the Stockton Air Pollution Exposure Project. Um, this is, um, the goals of this study are to um, learn more about air pollution exposures to school children in Stockton and to evaluate the effectiveness of school air filtration at reducing children's air pollution exposures. So we um, completed the field work in December of last year for this study. Um, We conducted it at All Saints Academy in Stockton, which is a a small parochial school um, that is located in Stockton. Um, You, uh, for those of you who have been to prior meetings and have heard our updates over the last year or so as we've been um, struggling to develop it, and figure out how to implement it while, you know, in the middle of the pandemic, you know, we've uh, encountered a lot of challenges. 
At one point, we were actually worried it might not happen at all. Um, but last November, our community partner at uh, Little Manila Rising put us in contact with the principal at All Saints Academy, who agreed to conduct the study at her school. And All Saints Academy, although uh, much smaller of a school than we had um, you know, really planned for, turned out to be a great community partner. The principal, Noemi um, Heidegge, uh, and was just super supportive of the study, as were the, the family in the school and the staff. They really were super helpful at getting the study up and running uh, quickly. Uh, ultimately, we enrolled 18 parent-child pairs. Um, the child participants provided urine samples before and after school, uh, after one school day on two consecutive weeks in December. Uh, the parent participants helped the kids collect the urine and also completed two online surveys. Um, ultimately, we collected 75 urine samples that were sent to the lab for analyses. Uh, for metabolites of selected polycyclic aromatic hydrocarbons, PAHs, um, and volatile organic compounds, VOCs, as well as biomarkers of oxidative stress and inflammation. Uh, we also are having cotinine measured as an indicator of um, tobacco exposures. Um, so in order to complement um, and help interpret the biomonitoring results from the urine samples, we also set up numerous air monitoring and sampling equipment um, throughout the school. Um, these, so we collected uh, information on fine particulate matter, black carbon, PAHs, VOCs, and we did some sampling for particle source analysis. And um, these were set up in uh, the classrooms as well as in two outdoor locations on the school grounds. And all of this equipment, you know, we set it up right before the sampling. Um, we took it down when we were done with the sampling with the exception of the purple air monitors, which measure PM 2.5. Um, those are continuing, they are, can, they're still set up and are continuing to run and will provide data on PM 2.5. Uh, we also set up standalone air filtration units um, in two of the classrooms during week one, so that half of the student participants for whom we had the complementary air data uh, were um, in classrooms with the standalone filtration units and the other half were in classrooms without the standalone filtration units. And then during the second week, we set up uh, an uh, the air filtration in an additional four classrooms. And these, uh, these IQ Air filtration units, uh, they're the IQ Air Pro Plus. They're primarily designed to filter particles, um, but they do also filter for VOCs. Now, I know this, uh, this, this is a complicated slide. Don't worry about all the details. Um, it's a schematic showing the location of the uh, the student participants, the air filtration units, um, as well as the uh, indoor air sampling and monitoring that we had set up during the week one. And I'm, I'm really only showing it just to give you a flavor for um, all the different devices that we set up and, and really the richness of the air quality data that we collected, which um, will really help us in interpreting our biomonitoring results. And so this is the, the sampling, the setup for the week two. It's essentially the same other than um, we set up some additional sampling for VOCs and set up those additional um, air filtration units. So then the idea is um, we will uh, compare the chemical levels in the urine samples collected both before and after school and between the classrooms with and without the air filtration units. Uh, we'll also compare the air quality results inside the classrooms to the, um, the levels outside the classrooms, but on school grounds. And having all this data um, and looking at it in conjunction with the biomonitoring data um, will really uh, help us um, uh, interpret our results. 
So as I said, all the recruitment the, and field collection is done. Um, we've sent the samples, the air samples and the urine samples off for analyses. Um, we're starting to get some results trickling in, um, but we anticipate having all the data in hand by the end of April. Uh, so then we'll spend the spring and the summer conducting some of our initial biomonitoring data analysis and uh, preparing the packets of individual results returns. Uh, and then uh, in the fall, we'll, we'll plan to give presentations to share the general findings of our study. So then the next uh, biomonitoring study that we are planning and hoping to initiate in May is called, the Bio, is called Biomsphere which is the biomonitoring component of the San Joaquin Valley Pollution and Health Environmental Research Study. Um, this is, a, the Biomsphere is, it's a collaborative effort, um, as you can see, involving uh, many different institutions and government en entities, including partnerships with uh, the Central California Asthma Collaborative as well as Little Manila Rising, which are two community-based organizations that um, are uh, very actively working on air pollution issues in the San Joaquin Valley. So the plan is, um, what Biomsphere is, is really to add a biomonitoring component to an existing research project, um, which is SPHERE. So before I get into the specifics of Biomsphere, uh, I just want to step back and tell you a little bit about Sphere. So this is a project funded by the California Air Resources Board. The PIs are Asa Bradman from UC Merced and Betsy Noth from UC Berkeley. Um, and the overall objective of this um, study is to assess exposures to air pollutants and noise among families living in Fresno and Stockton, which are two communities heavily burdened by air pollution in the San Joaquin Valley. Um, it will involve 90 child parent pairs and include household air monitoring and sampling for selected criteria air pollutants, um, as well as black carbon and VOCs. Um, um, there are also for the adult participants, they will be um, collecting personal air sampling for the selected criteria air pollutants by wearing, I think they're going to be little, little backpacks um, that they wear throughout the day. Um, and they'll also be collecting measurements of noise levels and um, using surveys to collect additional information on exposures. Um, so, um, Biomsphere will then build on the, all the resources that Severe Sphere is collecting um, by collecting up to 270 urine samples from the Sphere participants, including some repeat samples in a subset of households. Um, and then the urine samples will be analyzed for the, the same suite of biomarkers that we are looking at in SAPEP. And then Biomsphere will also add uh, some air sampling for measurements of PAHs and related compounds, again, to, to help interpret the biomonitoring results. So the, the goals of Biomsphere are uh, to directly evaluate air pollution exposures to families living in these um, two highly burdened communities. Um, to examine differences in exposures between individuals um, as well as within individuals over time and across the two communities, uh, to better map hyperlocal air pollution exposures in the two communities, to um, provide comparative data, um, which will help us uh, with the interpretation of the results from SAPEP. Um, Biomsphere is going to have um, quite a bit of a larger sample size, so that will be useful. Um, and to build uh, community capacity um, in the San Joaquin Valley so they can continue um, to work as partners in um, biomonitoring studies in the future. So then, uh, so that's where we're at now and uh, what we've been doing. Um, but now moving towards how we want to plan for 
future community uh, biomonitoring studies that can support um, the, the goals of AB 617. Um, you know, right now the proposed state budget um, for the upcoming fiscal year includes $350,000 a year for ongoing funding to conduct targeted biomonitoring studies um, in support of AB 617. So uh, the goals of these studies are to complement and validate ongoing air monitoring in communities heavily burdened by air pollution, uh, to increase our understanding of local exposures and um, potential health risks faced by folks living in these communities, and to evaluate specific emission and exposure reduction measures. Um, this ongoing funding will allow us to serve communities that um, are diverse with respect to geography, with respect to the types of chemical exposures and the sources of those exposures, um, uh, as well as the demographic characteristics and socioeconomic stressors. So um, to explore the, the diversity and identify key priorities for our targeted biomonitoring studies, we've been engaging with communities and other stakeholders for a number of years. Um, this has included discussions at public forums, such as SGP meetings, um, as well as AB 617 community steering, uh, community steering committee meetings. Um, we've also drawn on findings from the program's listening uh, sessions with community organizations across the state, um, as well as other reports, such as AB 617 community emission reduction plans. Um, so putting all that together, um, I'll now be just showing a series of slides on what we've learned so far. So, Communities have identified uh, key priorities for biomonitoring studies, which uh, include a number of recommendations, um, including um, actively uh, to actively engage with communities to design and implement biomonitoring studies, uh, to provide education and resources to build community capacity for partnering in biomonitoring studies, uh, to measure more chemicals, as well as address multiple chemical exposures and potential synergistic effects. Um, uh, and then, you know, uh, I think a, a very strongly recurring theme is to produce practical results. So results that are actionable that can be linked to potential health outcomes um, and can be used to develop and evaluate policies and strategies to reduce chemical exposures. So then uh, here's a, a, a list of selected uh, air pollution sources of concern that have been identified by many of the impacted communities across the state. Um, these include freeway and road traffic, uh, truck idling, port and warehouse activities, uh, backyard burning, which actually also includes in a lot of areas um, concerns about burning in, you know, open burning in homeless encampments, uh, residential wood burning, uh, exposures around agricultural activities, um, exposures around uh, related to refineries and fracking, and metal processing facilities. So then the, the air pollutants of concern related to those um, sources of exposure include criteria air pollutants such as PM 2.5, uh, PAHs, uh, VOCs, pesticides, and metals. So then, uh, so in, in thinking about choosing and designing future community biomonitoring studies, um, that can support the goals of AB 617 and address these community priorities, there are a number of factors, factors to consider. So these include 
the, the nature of the air pollutant exposure. So can the chemicals of concern be biomonitored? You know, do we have a biomarker? Um, are there specific strategies for exposure reduction that could be evaluated? Um, like for example, the school air filtration that we evaluated in CPAP. Um, are there types of exposures relevant uh, to other communities beyond the community in which the study is being conducted? Um, and then it's also important to think about the characteristics of the community. Um, so where is it? Uh, what are its demographics? It's uh, the socioeconomic stressors posed on the community, as well as, um, you know, are there other chemical exposures and other environmental hazards um, that are important in the community? And, um, and then obviously, or, you know, it's also important to think about uh, the availability of both research and community partners that um, that can uh, help uh, that can be collaborative collaborators in in conducting these studies. Um, so then, you know, how do we go about identifying and developing projects for community biomonitoring? Um, you know, what what should that process look like? So, you know, uh, clearly we will continue to attend AB 617 CSC meetings and, and other relevant community meetings and proactively reach out to community leaders and organizations to look for opportunities. And, and this is what we did in um, developing SAPEP. Um, we also plan to, in, you know, continue to engage with researchers to identify ongoing projects that could benefit from adding a biomonitoring component and um, could then uh, help advance the goals of AB 617. So that's pretty much the approach we used in developing um, Biosphere. Um, we also, and Narissa mentioned this in her talk earlier, you know, we also want to think about uh, creating a public and transparent process for communities and researchers and other stakeholders to propose project ideas. So issuing something like a request for information where folks can go online and give us their ideas um, for projects. And then Another type of project we might think about pursuing is, um, you know, one that would, uh, ones that would help us identify and develop the capacity to measure additional biomarkers that are um, related to air pollution exposures. And so ways we might do that is, you know, seek assistance from other state biomonitoring programs that maybe have uh, capacity that we don't currently have, um, as well as contracting with researchers to um, develop new methods. Oh, I'm sorry. I don't know what happened there. Let me just go back. Ah. Sorry about that. Let me just get back to where I was. Okay, so it's almost to the end here. So um, I just wanted to uh, finish up with uh, listing some topics for discussion um, that we'd like to get input on from the panel and the audience in the, the next discussion section that's going to, uh, session that'll follow. Um, and some of these overlap with some of the things that Marissa laid out earlier. Um, we definitely would like to hear about existing research projects for which a biomonitoring component could be added that would help further the goals of AB 617. Um, in particular, you know, if this, uh, the funding, the anticipated funding comes through for these ongoing biomonitoring projects, um, you know, we're going to need to act quickly. Um, and so for the near term, we do especially be interested in projects um, that are currently working with a community partner that are enrolling participants over the next year um, in regions that we haven't uh, conducted studies yet um, and that are collecting complementary exposure and health information. Um, we uh, also would like to hear options for how we might 
um, collect those uh, ideas and what uh, factors we might want to consider in evaluating the project ideas. And then um, finally, just here any ideas you all may have about how we might identify and develop um, la laboratory capacity specifically to measure um, additional biomarkers related to air pollution. So, um, so I guess before we get to that discussion, though, I think I have a, a few minutes to answer any questions that people may have. Okay, thank you very much. That was a very um, interesting uh, presentation. And I know that we're going to have a, a great discussion about that. But for the moment, now we will, as you said, uh, look for some clarifying questions from the panel as well as from the audience. Um, Cheryl, I think there was a question um, received via Zoom webinar. Um, there, there was a question dropped into Q&A that has been answered in the Q&A by Narissa. Um, you might want to first see if there's questions from the yeah. panel. Okay. Um, yes, let me see if I, we have any raised hands here from the panel. I see that Tom has his hand raised. Yeah, this is kind of a... Uh quick but kind of deep dive technical question. I was really interested to see that you used uh, IQ Air filters for the Stockton schools, uh, which is a great idea. I mean, they're, they're great units. And having worked with different air cleaning units, they um, the question is, how do you uh, make sure they don't turn the fan speed down <laughs> or maybe that's not <laughs> something you know, because these units, even though those are probably IQ Air, are probably the quietest ones, or one of the quietest units out there. But I still think they run up to sixty decibels, which is you know louder than a refrigerator. It can be annoying to people, and yeah. I'm sure in a classroom with all the other things going on is a great temptation to just turn that fan speed down to the lowest setting, assuming it won't make a difference. But of course, the units, if they're sized for the room are probably designed to be operating at one of the higher speeds. And I, th I mean, they might actually, I think IQ Air may have as much as like sometimes three or six speeds. So it's tempting to, to crank it down a little bit. Yeah, a, a great question. Um, we did actually, well, so one thing is we have no way of knowing if the teachers are fiddling with, you know, fiddled with the settings uh, during the study. So. We don't know that. Um, we did actually ask the principal after the first day if any of the teachers had complained about the noise. And she said uh, one of them had, but she also said, you know, it was only, it was, uh, you know, she encouraged them to just bear with it because there was only, really only four days two days one week, two days the next week where they had to keep running them, you know, for the purposes of the study. So she really gave the message to the teachers not to, to mess with them, you know, whether or not, you know, how that translated to reality, we don't know. Um, one of the things that one of the teachers did say to me, though, when I was, I asked her about the noise, she said, oh, well, the kids are, you know, the classrooms are pretty noisy anyways, <laughs> uh, you know, that, so she wasn't bothered by it, but yeah, I, we'll have to see how that, uh, yeah, I don't know what else to say about that. Thank Thank, thank you. I'm looking to see if there are any other um, clarifying questions from any panel members. Um, I have a question. I have one. Okay, so there you go. Jose, um, you have a question. Yes, uh, thank you for the presentation. Um, um, the first one is just a comment, and I am I am so happy to hear that you, you, a lot of, or if not most, of the work that you do is really centered around around the community, and all the efforts that you have been describing there to uh, not just disseminate the findings, but open it up so the community can start engaging and developing their own potentially their own studies through these RF uh, requests for information they have. So. So that, that's fantastic, I'm so happy to hear that. Uh, I had just a general question. So since we were talking about the air filtration piece, um, so you mentioned that these, these uh, 
filters were on for, for just a total of four days, two days one week and two days another. Is that how I understood it? Well, um, that's what we told them to do. They may have left them on in the interval between, because we did the study Monday and Tuesday of one week, Monday and Tuesday of the next week, um, whether or not they actually ran them, you know, the end of that, the interval between week one and week two, we don't know. And actually since, since the uh, completion of the field work, we have been looking at some of the purple air data inside and outside the classroom. And it looks like they're not running them anymore, even though we left them there or just based on the fact that we're not seeing any gradient in the indoor outdoor. We don't know. Yeah. So uh, um, with my, my underlying question there is, do you think you might be able to see with that short amount of time, I think it would be what, like six hours each day that, uh, a child a little bit more than that like yeah a six six and a half yeah. maybe seven uh, how um do you think that's enough time for you to be seeing changes in the biomarkers we do the biomarkers are they have pretty short half-lives um so we feel confident and uh and then just my last question with that regard would, would you consider are you so for this particular you haven't rolled 18 is that that's your that's your total and yeah. right that you're thinking about yeah. so th this is you're thinking of this more as a pilot and are you thinking of taking this somewhere um what are your plans here well that's one of the things we're we, we want to work through and talk about um in the next session i mean yeah it it is given our small sample size it's going to be seen as or viewed as some preliminary data um and yeah, we'll have to kind of, you know, the, the, the results from Biomsphere, I think will build on this somewhat, although we won't have the, the, uh, the air filtration piece to really um, evaluate. Susan, can yeah. I just chime in here for a second? This is Sarah. Um, so to clarify, Jose, you said you're thinking about 18. No, this is not the study design. This is the study outcome. We were trying to get 60 participants. So um, we're still hopeful that we'll see something very useful given how we designed the study, but it's not like we designed it to be small. Obviously, that was not the, the case. As Susan explained, we were just excited that we had a study uh, at all. I'm gonna pass it back to Ulrika. We only have a few more minutes for questions and we have a question in the chat to our Q&A to, to address and someone wants to speak. So I don't know if there's other panel members, but just wanted to let you know that's happening. Okay, um, I don't at the moment see any raised hands from other panel members. So um, we can go to the, the question, let's see, this was in the Q&A. Yes, but Stephanie is going to um, invite Dr. Sumchai, who has her hand up, to speak and provide her question slash comment uh, verbally. Okay, great. Yes, yeah, so Dr. Sumchai, I'm going to unmute you now so you can provide your comment. So if Dr. Sumchai is not ready to speak, Stephanie, why don't you go ahead and just read the two uh, points that are in the Q&A right now. Just read them aloud for people. Okay. Um, Dr. Sumchai stated, I would add diesel particulates to the suite of TACs of major concern. Um, diesel contains about 20 carcinogens. Cal EPA and VirusScreen measures diesel particulates, as does the EPA EJ screen. The community we are working with in San Francisco with the AB617 Marie Harrison Bayview Air Monitoring Network ranks in the 95th percentile for diesel PM. And there's an, I'll, I'll just quickly chime in to say, yes, thank you very much. Uh, and certainly when we talk about particulate matter, we're including diesel particulate matter in that umbrella. Um, and Stephanie, do you want to just go ahead and uh, mention the other comment in the Q&A? Sure, we also received a comment from Jeff um, 
pardon my pronunciation, Esquivel. Uh, regarding community concerns, metal shredding activities were noted. Perhaps other recycling shredding activities, paper and plastics also may be beneficial. And I just, thank you. I, I noticed that um, Dr. Sumchai has her hand raised still. Did she want to speak now? Uh, she is still unmuted. I, I don't okay. hear. Um, Dr. Sumchai, if you can type again into the um, Q&A if you would like to chat still, speak. And we still have an hour, you know, we're moving on to the discussion session. So um, she can certainly speak and chime in during that hour. I think we should go ahead and move on to that. So you can put up the integrated discussion questions that we prepared for you. Okay, are they going to be displayed? Yes. Okay, great. Or we can do that for you if you prefer, but if yeah. Uh, that would be great. If you, um, okay. <laughs> uh, <laughs> how do I, I, I'm not sure how I do it. So. <laughs> okay. Sorry. No problem. Let's see. Elizabeth, right. do you mind, um, or do you want me to do that, Elizabeth? I can pull it up and share. Do that. Okay. And 